Hi guys, welcome to the channel. We have a lot of materials today to cover in this video. It's being made on March the 28th, 2020. So it is important to know the date because the information I'm about to present to you changes by the hour. As of right now in the United States, we have 120,000 cases of COVID-19 infection and nearly half of them are actually located in the state of New York. So that is the epicenter of COVID-19 in the world right now, which is in New York City. So far, we have above 2,000 deaths, and that represents the uh, fatality rate or the casualty rate or mortality rate rather of 1.5%, which is higher, significantly higher than the normal regular flu season, which has a mortality rate of 0.1%. So this is about 10 to 15% more lethal than the regular flu. Very serious infection. So two weeks ago, I made a video about the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States and I lay out two major variables or two major factors that would determine the course of the pandemic in this country. And I mentioned two very important variable. Number one is how are we gonna stop the influx of infected people into this country? Number two is the mitigation strategy on the existing cases in the United States. Those two variables will determine the course of the pandemic in this country. I also discussed the bell-shaped curve that we see in all the major pandemics worldwide. And that curve is now in the exponential phase of what we see worldwide, not just in the United States. How high is the peak is going to be? How long is it going to take? We cannot determine that at this time because if we are still able to get the existing cases under control and mitigate the spreading of this virus, we will be able to flatten that curve, which does not look like at this moment. So if you go back to the case of China, for example, their bell-shaped curve, actually the peak of it took about eight to nine weeks to reach. We are at week number two of the pandemic, true pandemic in the United States. So we still have a long way to go. So I think that the peak will not be reached at least until May. And maybe it's gonna peak around May or June and then start to go down from there. So the overall testing in the United States is about 8% positive. Now in the case of New York City, the positivity rate is upward of 28%, which is three times higher than the national rate. And New York City is in a very unique situation. First of all, it's very highly densely populated. It is a world travel hub. Uh, literally anywhere in the country travel to the United States via New York uh, most of the time. And they had patients infected with COVID-19 walking around the state of New York, particularly New York City, for at least four weeks before the lockdown was ordered. So therefore, they're way behind the uh, control, the mitigation strategy control uh, of that city. Now, there are some interesting numbers coming out of Italy uh, that I would like to share with you. So far in Italy, there are no children under the age of 15 have been reported to die from COVID-19. Also, less than 1% of the deaths are related to people who are less than 50 years of age, which means over 99% of fatal cases are in adults older than the age of 50, and they have at least three chronic diseases, comorbidities. The reason why SARS-CoV-2 virus has been so successful as a pandemic virus and so lethal is because it is so well put together and it is just about the worst nightmare that you can have in infectious disease and public health. First of all, it is very easy to transmit. In fact, it is much easier to transmit than a flu virus. I strongly believe that it is aerosolized and it, it does have a component of airborne transmission to it, which makes it very easy to transmit. Number two, it is lethal. So if you compare it to the regular flu season influenza, which has a mortality of, I mentioned 0.1%, the COVID-19 has a mortality rate 
worldwide at this point of about 1% to 1.5%. So it is about 10 to 15 times more lethal than a regular flu. So the audience has asked the question to, is it true that you can transmit this virus during the period of incubation? So more and more studies have come out and shown that in fact, you can shred the virus and you can transmit this virus during the incubation period where most of people remain asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms. There are data coming out of the United Kingdom showing that people who were infected with SARS-CoV-2 display a very mild clinical symptoms, including mild fever, they have conjunctivitis or inflammation of the conjunctiva of the eye, they can have a little sore throat, they can have a little runny nose, and they can have a loss of smell. Uh, also, studies coming out of China showing that this virus can cause mild symptoms related to GI tract. So people don't have fever, people don't have to cough or the shortness of breath, but the initial symptoms are related to uh, diarrhea or some abdominal discomfort. Because the symptoms are so mild and they are so flu-like and cold-like, it makes it very difficult to say who actually was infected with the virus and who is not. Now, couple that with the easy transmissibility of the virus and lethality of this virus, make this virus so dangerous to become one of the most dangerous pandemic virus that we've known since 1918, which was a Spanish flu. So the upcoming challenges that we're facing in this country will be multiple folds. Number one, New York State is currently the epicenter of the world for COVID-19 infection. And what's gonna happen next is that the people from New York will travel outside of New York State and they will plan the seats in other states. We are already seeing this in Florida. We are already seeing this in Louisiana and the neighboring states such as Long Island, for example. And from there, it will spread like wildfire if there is no mitigation strategy from stopping that spreading from the epicenter of New York City. Number two, if we don't make the testing more easier, more feasible and blanket test the population, we will not be able to isolate those who have mild symptoms and those are actually the spreaders because they don't have much of symptoms they have mild cases, they don't really need to go see the doctor, and they can spread it to the family members without knowing it. And this is very dangerous. And that is exactly what makes this virus so lethal is because it can spread under the radar. Number three, the mortality of COVID-19 in this country will rise because the public health system or the healthcare system in general will be stressed to its limit where we have scarcity of equipments, PPEs, there will be a large amount of doctors and nurses and supporting staff from the hospital who will get infected from this. And that will also scale back the number of available providers who are in the front line taking care of patients. And when three of these scenarios happen, we will have a perfect storm. So I have received a lot of questions concerning how bad is this gonna be? Are we going towards the Spanish flu of 1918 where an estimate of 50 to 100 million people die uh, from the pandemic? Uh, how bad are the rate of infections right here in the United States? And as you see, some of the doctors went on uh, television and projected up to 70 or 80 million Americans will be infected. And among those, uh, three to four million people will need ventilation support. And we are nowhere near the amount of ventilators available uh, to treat those cases. Uh, frankly, uh, that is unlikely scenario is gonna happen. And when they project those kind of numbers on the TV, uh, it frankly is very scary and it is frightening to the people. So let me explain what they really mean by projecting 70 million Americans will get infected. First of all, that projection is based on if we are doing nothing about this pandemic and we just let the COVID-19 virus ride its course. So what you're gonna see 
is a massive amount of Americans who get infected. However, 70 million people is not a first cycle of infection, but rather a two or three cycles of infection, meaning that you're going to see a batch of Americans get infected in 2020 and then 2021, 2022. And that three cycles, subsequent cycles will add up to roughly about 70 to 80 million Americans will get infected. And that's what the projection really meant. It is not meant to say right now, 2020, 70 million people or 80 million Americans will be infected. First of all, that scenario, that scenario is extremely unlikely and only happens if we absolutely don't do anything about it and we just let it ride Over. its course. Some of the most important clinical trials ongoing right now in this country, but also in the world, uh, scientists and doctors around the world are trying extremely hard uh, on finding a remedy and a medication to combat the COVID-19. And I want to bring it up to your attention to some of these medication being considered right now. First of all, when you look at the COVID-19 uh, infection, the pathophysiology involving the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which I did a video on an autopsy of a patient die uh, at the Beijing uh, CDC. And that report is very important. Uh, if you look at that video, you can understand much more about the clinical medication about what they present to you. So America, we are pioneering on remdesivir. Uh, remdesivir is basically an antiviral. It is made by the pharmaceutical company Gilead and it is a direct antiviral which interfere with the replication of the virus and it has shown quite significant promising result against the Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Coronavirus. Also, the SARS-CoV initial virus, SARS-CoV-1 if you will, back in 2003. So in vitro study, it has shown promising result against those two viruses and currently this particular medication is being used in hospital, not just on a compassionate base, but in an expanded base. It means that patients who need this medication will get this medication. And in the coming weeks, we can have much more data coming out on the proven efficacy of the remdesivir. But so far, it looks pretty promising. The second combo is antiretroviral medications to treat the HIV medication. Uh, they are known as Caletra, which is a combination of lopinavir and uh, ritonavir and these two medications are actually extensively studied in Japan and also in South Korea and from the New England Journal of Medicine we have a, a study that was published showing the efficacy of this Caletra or uh, lopinavir and ritonavir combination and it's just not panning out it's just not as efficacious as initially thought compared to control groups so this combination of medications actually falling out of favor in terms of clinical trials. And of course, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine is making huge tidal waves now across the globe. Everybody wants to get the hand on this medication. I have patients who suffer from rheumatoid arthritis who take this medication on a daily basis and I have tremendous problem getting these patients to them where I personally call up the pharmacy and none of the pharmacy have this medication because they're being hoarded by the government at this point. And uh, based on the study coming out of France and also the anecdotal evidence that the hydroxychloroquine in combination of zinc and azithromycin can halt the replication of the virus. It does look very promising. So at this point, uh, I, I think that this treatment is definitely a valid treatment uh, to go ahead and try it on people with COVID-19. The other uh, clinical trial medication ongoing right now, which also shown a lot of promise which is what we call the interleukin-6 inhibitor. Now, if you look at my autopsy report video, I explained to you what interleukin-6 is. Basically, when the SARS-CoV-2 virus infect a cell in the lungs, uh, ultimately on day number 10 or day number 11, from 10 to 11 days after infection, it triggers a massive inflammation response from the body. And in medicine, we call that cytokine storm. Basically, your own body makes so much of inflammatory signals that you are drowning your own white cells, mainly the lymphocytes. And basically, you die because of inflammation 
over inflammation reaction and that triggers lung injury and that causes acute respiratory distress syndrome and that then causes respiratory failure and the demise of the patient. So the interleukin-6 inhibitor is currently being studied right now and it is pioneer in China. The first one is called tocilizumab uh, and the second one is called sarilumab being studied extensively. They are very expensive medication. Each injection costs upwards of $3,000. These medications actually reduce the risk of lung injury and reduce the risk of uh, ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome and help patients to recover from lung injury caused by COVID-19. Another one that is being pioneered and that is covalescence plasma, meaning that we are taking the blood from a patient who has been infected with COVID-19, we spin down the plasma and we extract the plasma, isolate the antibodies because these antibodies are being produced by the body naturally to fight the SARS-CoV-2 virus we then would transfer these antibodies into a newer patient infected with a SARS-CoV-2 virus in hope that the antibodies being made will be able to fight off the virus and kill off the virus. And it's also showing uh, some promising signs, but it's way too early to tell whether or not covalescent plasma is actually uh, the way to go. And as you know, the Vaccine is currently underway in Seattle. A couple of weeks ago, they already went over uh, the first injection in 45 healthy individuals volunteer in Seattle for the vaccine. So they have to wait for 30 days to receive the second injection. And then we have to wait one full year to study the efficacy of this vaccine, whether or not it truly protects people uh, from COVID-19. And we will note the result. And the last thing I want to say about this pandemic is that this virus does not discriminate against anyone. It attacks the poor, the rich, the unknown, to the Hollywood celebrities, a homeless person, to a prince, a prime minister, and even a president. The only thing that can defeat this virus is the resilience of the human race. There is nothing that we cannot survive if we put our difference aside and we work together towards a common goal. We have survived every pandemic in the past thousand years, including the plague, including the Spanish flu. And we have been through much worse pandemic than this. And we survived and we came out stronger. So I know that this too shall pass. This too shall pass. Stay safe, stay home, and I'll see you again in a couple of days.